Well, it's a beautiful day here. I just want, Mike seems a little hot on me here, guys, in the, B, in the bass section here. Um, I don't know. I don't know about you. You know about you, but I want to ask you a question. I don't know about you, but have you ever met anyone that planned to be overweight? Huh? Anyone ever planned to be overweight? I don't know about you. I, no? No one? Okay. I don't know about you, but do you know anyone that had a five-year goal to say, in five years, I plan on being completely bankrupt? In five years. That's what I... I don't know one that's ever, ever really thought like that. Or how about this one? I plan and I want to be, I want to be completely and hopelessly hooked on pornography. I know, I do know some people that like pornography. But I don't know anyone that wants to wreck their marriage and end up having that take them to a place that they really shouldn't go. I don't know anyone that plans on doing something stupid, something sinful, okay? And then hide it and lie about it and lose the trust of the people that they love the most. Now, I don't know anyone that plans on wrecking their life. And chances are really, really good then when it comes to you, the people sitting in your chairs, you're not planning to make any stupid decisions. The problem is, most people do not plan to do stupid things. But they do them, don't they? Hmm? And that's why we're going to talk about what I believe has the potential to impact your life in a very, very powerful way. And I want to start off by reviewing what we talked about last week and we talked about the power of our decisions. Because for the most part, we need to understand that the quality of your decisions determines the quality of your life. Would you, understand, would you agree with that? The decisions you make determine the quality of your... I mean, you make your decisions, and ultimately your decisions make you. They make us. So the problem is, although we have good intentions, many of us are simply not good decision makers, and that's why we introduce the, the big idea of what I call pre-deciding, and this is good. Most people go through their lives without thinking. This is about thinking. The power of choosing ahead of time of what we're going to do in the future. And if you were with us last week, we introduced the big idea, and you'll find this all over Scripture, of choosing ahead of time what we'll do in the moment. And we introduce this concept when we're faced with what? Uh, some, some scenario of how to spend your money, what to say, what to look at, how to treat somebody, or where to go, or where not to go, or what to do, or what not to do. Whenever we're faced with a certain situation, what you smart people are going to do is you're going to pre-decide. We're going to make pre-decisions to take a certain action. Doesn't that sound smart? Huh? So instead of waiting until the moment to give in to temptation or let our emotions take us somewhere that we don't want to go, we're pre-deciding what we're going to do. Let me put it this way. Let me draw you an illustration. Now, you have like two, three lanes on I-95. Where I used to live in Michigan, we would have four and five lane expressways. We didn't call them interstate interstates, we call them expressways. And the time to get to the right-hand lane to get off the expressway would be what? Half mile? Mile before the, 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 the time to get off the... So what a smart thinking ahead person would do is they'd put on their signal, they'd check their mirror, they'd look over their shoulder, and they'd work their way to the right-hand lane so that when their exit came up, they would just simply exit. That's called pre-deciding I'm going to get off the road at this time. What do some people do? They start in the far left lane. They wait till they maybe get 100 feet before the exit, and they do the Mario Andretti in front of you. <clears throat> and then they get off. And all of a sudden, my car wants to follow that person. Because I want to tell them, don't do that. You almost killed me. Do you see the difference between those two drivers? The kind that just go, oh, and that's dangerous, isn't it? Huh? That's reckless. 
It's thoughtless. And if I may use another word, it's stupid. Let's not live our lives that way. We don't have to, do we? I mean, for the person that just swerved five lanes to get off right now, you thought to yourself, well, they could have prepared. They could have worked their way over to the right-hand lane and got ready to exit. Instead, they waited till the last second, and it was dangerous. How often do we live our lives this way? Hmm? So I want to introduce you to this series, and I want to introduce you to six statements. They're called the I am statements. And we're moving into a direction and, and who we're going to be. So we predecided who we are because when we know who we are, for example, I'm a safe driver, we'll know what to do. We'll get off on the right-hand lane. So let's review those I am statements. We put them in your notes, and we put them on the, on the screen so that you can actually own these qualities. And I'll give you a little clue. That's what we're going to talk about today. But let's talk about what we're deciding what we'll be. I am, oh, wait a minute, God is the great I am, right? I am. But these are all God kind of qualities. And this is what we're going to be. So what are we going to be? Say it with me all across the worship center. And for those of you watching online, we want to welcome you, and you can type it in to the statements there. What are you? I am. One more time. I am. I am. Consistent. I am devoted. I am generous. I got one table. One table. Don't make me, like when my dad was driving the, the car and we were messing around in the back seat, don't make me come down there. I am faithful. And I am a... Thank you. No, we're going to do it one more time. Okay? What am I? I am... Ready. I am. I am. I am. I am. And I am. Okay. When we predecide our decisions, and they won't be based on what feels good in the moment, but on who you want to be for the rest of your life, what they are is they're based on values. Because when our values are clear, our decisions are easy. Did you know that? If you know what your, your values are, let those decisions be be driven by your values. So let's drive into a new content this week. And I want to ask you the question, how many of you have ever given into temptation you regretted? Yeah, don't point at your spouse, just, I don't need an example. You've given into a temptation and you've regretted it. Say it again, me. Okay, for those of you with no hands up and didn't say me, I'll see you in the liar's class after church. Because we all have. We've all regretted something. So why did you give in to that temptation? Well, chances are, in most cases, in mo you gave in to that temptation because you weren't ready. You weren't, you weren't prepared. In fact, Scripture talks over and over and over again telling us about how you, how about I need to be prepared because our enemy is going to attack. That's the fact, Jack. In fact, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 13, he said, be on your guard and stand firm in the faith. Be courageous, be strong, be ready. Your enemy is attacking. Don't let your guard down. Have your guard up and become ready because he's coming. Paul said that. Jesus said in Matthew's gospel, chapter 26, he said, watch and pray. Why? So that you don't fall into temptation. You ever see somebody that fell down? Do you know what they say? I didn't watch where I was going. You got to watch. You got to pray because your spirit does want to do the right thing. Your spirit wants to do the right thing but because your spirit is willing, but your flesh is so weak. And that's why we pre-decided that we're going to keep our guard up. We're watching. We're praying. Why? Why are we ready? Why are we on guard? Why are we watching and praying? Two reasons. And I hate to tell you, number one, it's because the devil is coming for you. I just shared that with our, our belonging class. I said, before you gave your life to Christ, the devil had no problem with you. You were on his side. Once you got on the, on the Lord's side and you gave your heart to the Lord, Watch the devil pull out all the stops to try and break and ruin your life. Not that he hates you so much, but he hates anything that's close to the heart of God, and that is you. 
Our spiritual enemy has a mission, and I'll say it again in a different way, to, to steal, kill, and destroy everything that matters to the heart of God. In fact, it was the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. And he, and he said this, he goes, I wrote to you, why? So that Satan, the father of lies, will not outsmart us. For we are familiar with his evil schemes. He's studying you. He knows where you're weak. He knows where you're vulnerable. He knows how to attack you and take you out of God's will to hurt you and those people around you. So we're going to be ready, folks. Someone say, I'm ready. I, I think you need to be. Because let's face it, look at the world. It's pretty harsh right now. Because we know the devil is coming for us, we need to be ready. Number two, because you're not as strong as you think. Do you understand that? You're not as strong as you think. We tend to think that we can handle more than we can actually handle. And it's a very sobering warning in Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 says this. It says, hey, those of you who say, I don't need this, I ain't no weakling, I, and I can handle it, it's no big deal, I'm not worried about it, I got this thing, I got it covered, it ain't nothing. Y'all can't worry about it. It ain't worried. I'm not worried, but I ain't scared. Scripture says, hey, you, you know, big shot with the big guns. You think you're standing firm? Be careful. Because when you're overly confident, those are the people who tend to fall. Amen? You know what happens when you think it's all about you? That's pride, baby. That's not the spirit. That's pride. If you think you're standing firm, the word says, be careful so that you don't fall. And that's why we so often end up in a place that we don't want to be. Because we make decisions that don't honor God. I mean, and you're not stupid. None of us here are stupid. And we know the moment we start to make that decision that dishonors God, you know you're stepping into trouble. Amen? Amen? Okay, and if you don't know that, talk to somebody. And studies are really fascinating. You know, they show that people vastly overestimate their ability to resist temptation. We think we're stronger than we really are. And the technical term for that is known as restraint bias. Restraint bias. If you think you can fight off more than you can fight off. And that's why when they bring, like, say, <clears throat> excuse me, they bring, say, chocolate cake into the office. Right? And you walk by that thing, and you're fine the first time. And the next time you walk by it, all of a sudden you have cake in your hair, and you don't know what happened. Right? Because you thought you could handle more than you could actually handle. Why is that? Because we overestimate our ability to fight off the wrong things. And one of the reasons is, is because we have no idea how much energy it takes to resist temptation. Just fighting off temptation. It drains us. We become fatigued. I mean, mentally we become fatigued. That the part of our brain that controls our willpower, do you know what happens now? See if this plays out in your lives. The thing that makes us control willpower, it kind of wears out, you know, and that's the, the very reason, like, say, the people you work with. Anybody work with crazy people? Just people that are just crazy. Yes. Yes. Okay. I see both hands on one person, like he's surrendering. Okay? It's like they just make you crazy all day long. Or maybe you have family members that do that. I don't know. And you're wanting to unleash. You want to go just nuts on them. But you're godly, and you fight it off, and you fight it off, and you want to say something. You want to do something. But you don't want to do that. And so you fight it off all day long. Right? And then Aaron comes home and then he says something stupid to Mary. Oh, I'm sorry. I was specific. Then Brian comes home and he says something stupid to Karen. That's an amen there. Okay? In other words... You will go home and you'll yell at your spouse. You'll make good decisions all day long and you'll come home and you'll just binge eat because your willpower is starting to wane. Our self-control, our willpower, you know, it's a limited resource. 
And the more we use it, the less we have. And it has to recover. It has to rebuild. So we need you to understand that at those times, the devil is coming for you. And you're not as strong as you think. So what we're going to do, because we're going to be weak, you're going to be weak, is we're going to pre-decide to be ready no matter my strength. Does that make sense? Okay. So I, what I want to share with you today is what I call the three keys to fighting temptation. And we're, and we're going to decide, pre-decide that is, three things. What are we going to pre-decide? We're going to pre-decide, and I need you to write these down because this is life-changing stuff. We're deciding to move the line. Write it down. We're going to move the line. We're going to pre-decide to magnify the cost. And we're going to pre-decide, this is a good one, to plan your escape. What are we going to do? Say it aloud to everybody. Take a look at the screen. Go ahead. Everybody take a look at your notes and on the screen. We're going to move the line. Say it. We're going to move the line. We're going to magnify the cost. And we're going to plan the escape. These are three life-changing things. If you've got a battle of sin or anything like that, dude, that's what you need. Zach, is that for me? Can it be for me? Okay. He had a bottle of water. I was hoping to get one off him. That's okay, Zach. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I got five people just walked out of the church. I'm thirsty. I'm not going to die. We're going to be ready because our spiritual enemy is gunning for you. And I know what you're thinking. Well, I've been in the church so long, I can't be touched. That is a lie from the pit of hell. It is. The first thing I want to talk to you about is to demonstrate how we're pre-deciding ahead of time to, uh, to move the line. And, and in fact, it'd be really amazing for an illustration. Um, gee, does, does anybody have a roll of blue tape anywhere? Yeah, a roll of blue tape. Anyone have a roll, just a roll of blue? Ah, oh, Pastor Eric has a roll of blue tape. See how that worked out. My goodness, that's amazing. What a coincidence, praise God. Look how good our God is. Thank you, Pastor Eric. Ladies and gentlemen, Pastor Eric, take a bow, Pastor. Okay, you stay here, stay here. Okay, so, all right, all right, don't make an embarrassment of yourself. Okay, so we're going to move, and this is just so amazing. What I want to do is I want to put a line down. So, Pastor Eric, would you take this and back up, back up. Good, good, good. And we're going to put the line Right, right there, right there, right there's a good line. Okay, let's put that down. Okay, and we're going to put a line there. He's such a good little brother. He is. <laughs> Stand up and take a bow. Okay, so also, also, we're also going to assume that, that yeah, you're not done. This is the line of sin. This is the line that we're going to call sin, and you all face sins, okay? Going on the other side of this line is not God's will. This is wrong and it's dangerous if I step over. This is this side. This is the God honoring side on this side, okay? It's God honoring. This is the sin side. Don't make me sin alone. Come over here. Okay. This is the sin side. Sin, sin, sin. Sin, sin, sin. sin, sin, sin. Okay. And, and this is the right side. So, what do we typically do, huh? And don't act like you're holier than thou than everybody else. Don't do that. Don't. Okay. Where there's the line, what we do. What do we do most of the time? What do we like to do? We like to go right up to, right up to the line. Don't we? I have had crazy conversations with Christians like, Pastor, how close can I get to sinning without actually sinning? Have you ever had that conversation with people? Once or twice. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Okay. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to I, I get right up to this line, okay? And I want to do as much as I can. Anybody know what I'm talking about? All right. Don't sit there and polish your halo. It's not getting anywhere, okay? But what's funny is, is that what many of us do, we do some things that we know are bad, but there are some things we know that are really dangerous, and so we never do that, right? We never, oh, danger there. Like uh, tightrope walking. That, no, 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 uh-uh. Watermelon swallowing. No, okay. Um, wife arguing. We don't do that either. 
No, okay. What I do, and if I know that that's really dangerous, I stay away from that line. So we know our spiritual enemy is coming at us. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? If there's a line of sin, just a line of sin, what we're going to do is we're going to move the line. That's good. That's great. Now the sin's there. Eric and I are going to stay over here. So if that's the sin, this is my line. I don't even go there. All right? If I have, a trouble, if I have trouble getting drunk and I know it's a sin, going into the bar is the sin. I never even go in the... Well, no, getting drunk in the bar is the sin. But my line is, I don't even go in the bar. Huh? And that could be anything else. Okay, you know, and some of you practice it religiously, that you'll gossip. You'll gossip, you'll gossip, you'll gossip. You tear down other people to make you look good. You do it, okay? And for me, I know, I know for me, this is Brian talking, not Pastor. Pastor Eric. Because he is holy. He is. He's just, isn't he holy? Your wife's here. Yes, I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Gossip is addictive. And I can, I can lend an ear to that, and I don't want to. Because I know it's unhealthy for the person trying to gossip, and I know it's unhealthy for my heart. So when they open their mouth to gossip, I'm back here. I don't even give an audience to it if they change the subject to somebody else and they don't have permission to talk about them. Okay? If this is wrong, step up wrong. If this is wrong, I'm not going to get as close as I can. Do my little step. It was cute. Do it. No arms? You don't do the arm thing? Did you, it's a penguin. Come on. It's also the shirt. The shirt says I, I want to. Okay. So, if I know that this is my sin spot, sorry, I moved the line, and I'm here, and I'm okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Pastor Eric Larson. Thank you. So how will this play out? Um, mm, mm. Let's say you have the spiritual gift of spending money on Amazon. Right? Buy now, click, and it's here. Same day delivery for the glory of God. It's amazing. How do they do that? I don't know. But let's say you're spending too much. Well, here's the line. Here's the line of Amazon. The Amazon line. Well, I'm not going to spend. I'm not going to spend. I'm not going to spend. I'm, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You know what you're going to do? There it is. You're going to move the line. How do you move the line? You give your best friend the password so that you don't get to click buy, click buy, unless your friend gives you the password, okay? We're moving the line. Let's say how much time you spend looking on Instagram, which is trash, right? Tra Instagram. And maybe you're there for four and a half hours a day. I know you've got some really interesting friends. Can I give you some advice? Live your life. Don't look at theirs all the time, all right? But you think they're so interesting. How about you live your life? So what are you going to do? What you're going to do is you're going to move the line so far away that it's not distracting. And you're going to put limitations. And maybe you look for 30 minutes a day and that's it. And you're moving the line. Let's say every time you go out, you end up going to a club. Club, 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 da, 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 da. The next thing you know, you get drunk and you hook up. Well, what happened? Well... So tonight, to go out, I might, I might not get drunk, I might, I don't know, I might, I might not, I'm not going to hook up. No, 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 no. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're not going to go to the club, right? What we're going to do is move the line. Ah, oh, Pastor Brian, man, that is so restrictive. Like, I mean, that's no fun at all. I, is it no fun at all? I mean, none. You've got all of these rules, and it's so restrictive. And we're never, ever going to have fun. 
I, I love the way David said this in Psalm 16.6. He said, the boundary line for me, because I've fallen in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. It's incredibly freeing to me. Do you know that these lines, they're not limiting. They're freeing. Amen? They are. Everybody say, move the line. Seriously, I mean that. You got to move the line. Because if I do this, I wish you could see it. There's a line behind me. If I live here, this is exactly where the devil wants me as what we would call a lukewarm, frustrated Christian who's powerless. I think he wants us here. Would you agree? And if we spend more time here and less time there, Watch how Jesus is magnified in your life. So the second thing we're going to do is we're going to magnify the cost. Magnify the cost. So whenever we're tempted to give into temptation, there's always a risk, isn't there? You know this. And what I want to do is I want you to train yourself that when you're tempted to predecide to stop and ask, what could go wrong? What could go wrong? Because something can always go wrong. I went fishing the other day with my son-in-law. Tried to show him what a great fisherman I was and show him a wonderful time because he hadn't done much fishing in his life. And it was great up until the time the battery went dead, couldn't start the motor, and had to get towed back to the dock. That was yesterday. What could go wrong? Right? The big question if you pre-decide and you ask yourself, what's the worst case scenario? We're going to decide. We are. We've already, because we know the devil's coming for us and we know we're weaker than we think, so when we get close, even here, and we're thinking about it, oh, should I step over? No, 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 no. Well, what's the worst thing that can happen? That's a great question. What is the worst case scenario if it comes true? And your answer may be, well, someone could get pregnant when we didn't want them to get pregnant, right? Okay, maybe this is too real. Um, maybe you don't live in the same world that I live in, okay? Maybe we could lose our reputation. You could lose any kind of ministry you had. You would lose your integrity. You could lose your job. You could lose a loved one. We could financially find ourselves in a wreck. We could compromise our relationship with our kids or whatever. So let me give you a very scary verse. I love this, this verse, but it scares the crud out of me. And it should you too. Because it's so truthful. Numbers 32. No one reads the book of Numbers. It's a boring book. It's a book of Numbers. Oh no. There's some real juicy stuff in there. So let me just say that if you're sinning against the Lord and then this moment when your pastor tells you Numbers 32, this is what the word says. Your sin will find you out. What in the world does that mean? If you do it, it's going to be seen. It's going to be found out. It's going to come out. You will be found out. So what you want to do is you want to ask yourself, what is the worst possible thing that could happen? And then what you need to do is you need to magnify that cost. You will pre-decide that you're not going to do that which can hurt you later. And if I do this over and over again, I ask myself, well, what if I betrayed my vows? Oh. What if I lost my integrity? What if I betrayed my relationship with Karen? I could just magnify that cost. Do you know how bad that would be? Well, let me tell you what would happen. And here's what would happen. I would lose the trust and the respect of my best friend, the woman who has stood by my side and honored me with more love than I could ever describe to you, and I don't deserve any of it. My four children and my son-in-laws, they look up to me as a man of God, and you know what? I'd lose that in a heartbeat. There are, and I would say humbly, uh, probably hundreds, hundreds of hundreds of people, of you, that I would hurt you too. It would hurt some of your faith. I've seen that happen as a result of a pastor falling. 
It could devastate people who believe that, you know, you're not perfect, but you're seeking God. You know, you're trying to live the life of integrity. I could lose every bit of credibility, every bit, and every bit of spiritual authority. Listen to me. Five minutes of sin can wreck a lifetime of pursuing Jesus. And so what we're going to do is we are going to recognize, and you've got to do this, folks. I'm not talking about the boogeyman, but you have a spiritual enemy who's going to attack. And so we're ready. We're on guard. And when the attack comes, we're going to move the line. We're not going to be stupid and go way out there. Oh, I hope I don't get into trouble. No, we're going to move the line. We're going to magnify the cost. And my favorite thing, and this is where most people don't succeed, most people fail on this one, is that what we're going to do is we're going to plan our escape. This is so cool. Okay, we're going to decide ahead of time how we're going to get out of any temptation that our spiritual enemy brings to us. We're going to plan our escape. And the best example in all of Scripture is someone doing this in the Old Testament, and it was a guy named Joseph. Now, if you don't know who Joseph is, let me describe Joseph to you from God's Word. Scripture says that Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. Okay? Much like me. Okay? So, come on. Thank you. <laughs> from the blind section. <laughs> Amen. So, this guy is good-looking, and Scripture says that Potiphar's wife, Potiphar was, his, it was kind of his boss. His name was Potiphar. Potiphar's wife began looking at him lustfully. You know, hubba hubba, hey dude. He's noticing that he's a very handsome, well-built young man. And so she said to him, come on, come sleep with me. Okay, now that's just a little weird, but you have to appreciate the fact that she is clear. She's clear about this. And you notice that, well, and, and this is true because guys really don't, read cues too often. We really, we're kind of stupid in this way. We are. Um, but anyway, imagine how easy it would have been for Joseph to give in. I mean, think about it. He was like, well, the, the, uh, this isn't my homeland. My brothers don't even know where I am, and we're all alone. No one's going to find out. And this is, and this good-looking cougar, and I'm single. I am single, and I'm young, and she made the move, so it must be okay, right? Or, let me give you another way of thinking about it, and it's something that many of you do. And the reason I know that this is something you do, because this is something that I've done. He could have given in. He could have given in because he wasn't happy with God. Because he wasn't doing anything wrong when his brothers, if you know the story of Joseph, Joseph wasn't doing anything wrong when his brothers beat him up and put him in the pit. He wasn't doing anything wrong when his brothers pulled him out of the pit and sold him into slavery. So here he was in this really bad situation because God let him down. And so often we feel like, well, since God didn't do what I wanted him to do, I'm not going to do what he wants me to do. Don't ever do this. Don't ever do this. The very thing many of us do is we use our disappointments to justify our disobedience. Don't do this. Don't do this. What does it look like? What do I mean? Well, my spouse isn't meeting my needs, so I got to do what I got to do. That's what that is, huh? Right? God let me be in this spot, so I'm just going to go live in this spot. No. Joseph had pre-decided that he was going to honor God. She came on to him, and he faithfully resisted. He told her no deal. He's like, hey, your husband trusts me as a man of God. How can I sin against, how can I sin against him and against God? So he resisted. And what happened was, when he resisted, oh, when he resisted, she stopped. The angel sang, and he was never tempted again. And that ain't true. Do you know what happened? She kept getting up into his business. And one day she's like, hey there, dude, you're looking good. Hey, man, you're looking kind of lonely. What's a little thing like you doing in a palace like this? And day after day she hit on him. 
Day after day, she made her moves in the same way, day after day. And the day after day, the devil is going to come after you. Day after day, he's attacking because we know he's coming. And because we're not as strong as we think we are, and we're pre-deciding to plan our escape. Now, you might look and go, well, Joseph, that bro was strong. He was, you know. I want to tell you, he wasn't strong. Do you know what he was? He was ready. He was smart. And that's what you people are. He was smart enough to pre-plan his escape. Because scripture tells us, and this is so cool, one day, while they were alone, Potiphar's wife comes to him. He's on this side of the line, by the way. And she's just not saying stuff, but actually she grabs his coat and pulls it off him and says, let's go, it's time. And scripture says, he left his cloak in her hand and he ran out of the house. What did he do? He left his coat in her hand and ran out of the house. Why? Because he knew it was better to have a good name than a good coat. What does that mean? Come on, somebody. I'm going to let go of that which is going to hold me back. And some of you have a lot of stuff that's holding you back. And for those of you that don't have stuff that's holding you back right now, you had to let go of a lot of stuff to get where you're at. I am not going to let a coat hold me down and get me in trouble. I'm not going to hang on to a drug. I'm not going to hang on to porn. I'm not going to hang on to alcohol. I'm not going to hang on to cheating. I'm not going to hang on to lying. I'm not going to hang on to greed. I'm not going to hang on to gaining whatever I can to get mine. Uh-uh. Because I pre-decided my name is more valuable than any possession. I've pre-decided if she grabs, I run. Did you get that? Because I'm not strong enough to resist it. So I will run for... And the amazing thing about God is when you are tempted... And you will be tempted. The good news is, is our God is faithful. Amen? He's always faithful. He will never let you down. And it's so funny that Pastor Eric mentioned this shortly after praying. He will never let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And the good news is, is when you're tempted, Scripture says he will always give you an escape. Every single time. Every single time. There's no temptation. The devil will bring your way which God hasn't given you escape. There is no lust. There is no financial temptation. There's no breach of integrity. There's no relational loss, which God hasn't already said. There's the door. There's another way. So pre-decide. We choose ahead of time. The devil is coming to attack. I'm not as strong as I think I am. So I'm ready. I'm predetermined. I've moved the line. I've decided to magnify the cost. What's the worst that could happen? And I pre-decided if she grabs my coat, I'm out the door. I've pre-planned my escape. Because no one plans to screw up their life. But people do it all the time, don't they? Huh? No one plans to screw up their life, but most people don't plan not to. I'm telling you, with God's help, you can plan not to. So we're going to be on our guard. We are going to be ready. And what I want to do, if I can just incredibly honest, about where you're vulnerable. Where does your spiritual enemy attack you? Is it in your pride? How do you justify sin? Because you're mad at God? Hmm? Well, if God hadn't done, then I wouldn't be doing this. Or would it be something like, well, if she would be, then I would never, or whatever. Do you find yourself compromising, compromising financially? Your security there? Oh, you just love the bling that buys the things. Huh? Do you lie sometimes to make yourself look better? Are you awake? Are you with me? Do you gossip about people and make them look bad? Huh? It happened to me this week. Do you tell stories about other people to make you feel better? Do you judge others? Here's one. And you know this. Are you overly critical? 
Are you carrying unforgiveness in your heart? That's pretty much an indication that you're God, by the way. Do you find yourself giving into lustful temptations again and again and again, looking at things and acting in ways that you know is dishonoring God? Hmm? Do you find yourself taking God for granted? Do you wake up and just decide one day to be lukewarm? No. You used to be passionate about the things of God, but you're not passionate about the things of God now. Do you find yourself compromising around your friends? Now, that's a good question. I'll let you answer that one yourself. Hmm? What do I mean? Let's say you're one person in church and you're somebody else around the other people. Huh? So what we're going to do is we're going to be ready because the enemy is. Oh, yes. And we're pre-deciding we're ready. And we're going to put distance between ourselves and our temptations. You mean I got to dump my friends? Because that's the first question. When I became a Christian, it's like, oh wow, there's some really, there's some people out there that just want to influence me the wrong direction. And I had to think it over. Because it's not, it's not right to just stop seeing people, is it? Is it? I don't, well, here's my thought on this. If I have to separate myself from these people for a while, so that I can be a stronger believer in Christ and maybe, maybe a better witness for Christ or maybe a better example of Christ that I can bring back to those same friends. Because if I'm, you know, I could. If I, if I just hang with them and wallow in sin like I used to with them, I'm not doing them any favors at all. But if I make a temporary break for the purpose of getting strong, and then coming back and showing them truly what a new creation in Christ is, I have a better opportunity of not being hypocritical and showing them the love of God. I know that stinks. I know that's hard. And I know right now some of you are thinking of the people that are the hard influencers in your life, and you're thinking, do I really need to do that? I'm telling you what I had to do. I had to do it. Because I was a follower. I would do what they wanted to do. Drink, smoke, party, whatever it was. I would do it. So I had to step away from that so that I could get stronger in my faith and in my witness and my character. And I made new friends, friends at church, friends that were going to lift me up. Does that make sense? Uh, my mom used to talk about my friends and she'd say something about uh, I don't remember how she put it. It was like bad character. I mean, it's probably in the Bible, says the pastor. Um, like bad, bad character corrupts good judgment, something like that. Probably a proverb. Listen, we need to prepare because we know we're not that strong. And we're going to pre-decide ahead of time how to stay away from trouble when the devil attacks because he hates your guts. I'll give you a personal example of what I mean by, and I'll just be incredibly transparent if I could. And I hope it doesn't freak anybody out, but I've predetermined to be faithful to Karen for the rest of my life, whether she wants me to or not. She wants me to. I've predetermined. And I know a bunch of my friends that had that goal, but you know what? Not all of them achieved it, unfortunately. I have friends in ministry that couldn't achieve it. Not all of them. And so I have to tell you, that I am not above being tempted. I'm not. I'm a human being. And because I'm a normal person, what I'm going to do is I'm going to decide ahead of time to eliminate anything that could be tempting or even the appearance of tempting. So a few things. And it's not the extensive list, but a few things that I would do. And some of you know this. And I'm not lifting myself up. I'm just suggesting something. I'm not alone with a person of the opposite sex. And I've had people criticize me for this. I've had female pastors criticize me for this. Because I wouldn't meet with them alone. And she looked at me and she goes, and that's your problem. And I said, yes it is. <laughs> Accusations make headlines, retractions are buried. And during the time of the headline and the retraction, a pastor is destroyed. 
Not me. Not me. Criticize all you want, right? My wife appreciates it, huh? And if you're going, well, like Pastor Brian, are you all that vulnerable? Are you all that weak? Are you all that pathetic? And you need that kind of protection? The answer is no, actually, no. I'm very happily married, and I'm, and, and I'm very rarely tempted, uh, tempted, but occasionally tempted, because you people are too. Now, I don't know, maybe a few months from now, a weak or vulnerable moment, and if I'm ever vulnerable then, why, look, let me put it this way. Here's my two lines again, folks. Why would I fight something off that I can eliminate now? I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready, because I know the devil's going to attack, and he knows how to attack a man, and it's with you girls. You're just so pretty, and we're so messed up. So I have to ask myself, why would I resist the temptation in the future when I have the time right now to eliminate it today? Because the devil's coming for you. And he's going to destroy your reputation. He's going to destroy your witness. He's going to destroy your ministry, which, by the way, all of you should have a ministry. He's going to destroy your friendships. He's, and he's going to destroy your relationship with the spouse. Oh, and you're also going to destroy your witness before your kids. The devil's coming for you. And you're not as strong as you think you are. So what are you going to do? We're on guard. We're watching. We're praying. We're ready because we're not as strong as we think. And so we've pre-decided to move the line. I'm not going to get as close as I can to the danger. I'm going to stay far away. And you know what? Back here, the temptation isn't as strong. But the closer you get to that sin, oh, that temptation is stronger. So if you stay away from it, that which used to grab you looks stupid. Why would I bother? And then what happens is, is if I give it some thought, I'm going to magnify the cost. What's the worst possible scenario? I mean, what could happen? Let me put it this way about the worst possible scenario. Let me talk to you about magnifying the cost. I did this before I even came close to this message. I used to serve on staff at a large church. And that was a highly stressful position. I had a brother who served on staff at a large church. And understand, both of this were not church-going kids. I started going at the age of 19, first one in my family. My mom smoked. All of us smoked. We all smoked. Smoked a lot. Got into ministry. Quit smoking. Got saved. Talked to my brother one time. He's working in a high-stress position at a church on staff. And we were both in mega churches. 3,000, 5,000 people. And they can be monsters at times, folks. They can. Hats off to those people that can do it. But my brother asked me one time, he goes, Brian, he goes, you ever sneak a cigarette? Uh, sneak a cigarette out there? And I said, what do you mean? He goes, sometimes the stress has been so bad, Brian, I have to go out, I buy a pack, I, I smoke one cigarette on the road far away from everyone, and then I throw out the pack and I come home. He said, do you do that? I said, no. No. He goes, why? I said, I'll tell you why. Number one, I'm too paranoid. All it would take would be one person that knew who I was. One person from my church. Do you know what happens if I get caught smoking? Now, if you get caught smoking, it's no big deal. It, it really isn't. But if I got caught smoking, do you know what happens? I'd lose my house. No, no, I'd lose my job. Let's start there. I'd lose my job, possibly. I'd, uh, and my house is connected to my home. In other words, there's not a Nazarene church here in the town that I can go be the pastor to because you're done with me. I've lost my integrity. So I would have to go find another church, but I can't be a Nazarene pastor, and there's usually only one per town. So that means I've got to sell my house. I've got to uproot my family. I've gained the disappointment of my wife and kids, and I've lost the, the respect of everyone in here and anyone else before me that, uh, before this time that I've ministered to. So that is how I magnify. Oh, the other reason I don't do it, to be honest with you, that I, do, I wouldn't smoke, because I couldn't stop at one cigarette. That's honest. I'd get one cigarette, it'd be one pack, it'd be one carton, and I'd be hooked. Nicotine was the hardest thing I ever had to put down. And for those of you that have done it, 
You know what I'm talking about. It's insane. It's, it's a terrible addiction. And now it costs a small fortune, doesn't it? You see the price of cigarettes? I was at Walmart the other day, and I was standing in front of the, the package of thing, the things of cigarettes, and she's like, can I help you? And I was like, no, just looking. You know, like you would with a new car. No, I'm just looking, thanks. Couldn't believe the $100 for a carton of cigarettes? Isn't that crazy? So I magnified the cost. And I pre-decided, I'm not going to do it. Just not going to do it. Why, the question is when it comes to sin, why would I even go there? And then ahead of time, what we're going to do is we're going to plan our escape. And all this is based on what? Our values. Because when our values are clear, our decisions are easy. And so, when that moment, somewhere in the future, when you're like tired and you're hungry and you're angry or you're overwhelmed and you're emotional and you're depressed, and you know that's when you're vulnerable, right? Your decision, when you're tempted, it won't be based on emotion. No, no, no. Not on the emotion in the moment, but on the values that God has placed in your heart. And so what do we do? We commit it all, all of our ways to God. Our relationships, our friendships, our finances, our witness, our words, our thoughts. We commit it all to God and He will establish our plans. Amen? And because we know His Word and we know it is true, we decide ahead of time that when I'm faced with such and such scenario, I've already determined, I've predetermined in that moment, I'm going to choose to honor God. So what are we? We're ready. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. You need to be ready, folks. What are you? Are you ready? Okay. That's what I wanted to share. So Father, let's bow our heads. Father, help us as followers of Jesus to be ready to fight off the attacks of the evil one so we can faithfully share the love of Jesus in all that we do. Now those of you online, as we're reflecting, I want to give you a moment to think about any area of your life where your guard might be down. It might be down. How does your spiritual enemy attack you? Where are you vulnerable, folks? What are your values? Let's put it that way. What do you, if you find yourself vulnerable or maybe you're not prepared, I'm just going to ask you to determine today to pre-decide to be ready. And what you may do is just like I have. You may have to get a, a real game plan in your life where you pre-decide ahead of time, I'm going to eliminate distance. I'm going to eliminate the problem, such as this temptation, as much as possible. Now, this will take some work. It takes some thought. But I think your lives are worth it. Now, you may want to talk about this in your life groups, but we're going to predetermine, predecide today. And if you recognize that you're always under attack, and I hope you do recognize that you're always under attack, and you want the help of God to be ready, if that's you, would you just lift your hands right now and say, I want to be ready because I know the devil's coming after me. I do. A four. Four people. Amen. Amen. Lift them up. Online, for those of you watching online, just help me out. Say, be ready. Just put it in the comments section. Be ready. Let's pray. Father, we ask that we would be prepared in the same way Paul said to be on guard. We'd be on guard. And in the same way Jesus said, watch and pray so that we don't fall into temptation. We're going to watch and pray. And give us wisdom, God, ahead of time to pre-decide, to move the line, to distance ourselves from temptation, to magnify the cost knowing that if we dishonor you, we could hurt you, our, ourselves, and all those people around us. And God, to plan our escape, knowing that you are faithful, and you always give us a way out. Help us to choose to honor you and to be ready to fight off the attacks of the evil one so we can honor you by showing our love in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, for those of you who joined us online on television, we want to thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next week.